you guys know me. Sorry, we're trying to bring it up on the screen. I'm going to hold this this time just because, okay, just because I, I think I was having difficulty last time, so everyone can hear me in the back. Okay. Okay. So I can just put it back. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So remember what we talked about last time, right? We were pretty much, just to summarize real quick, we were talking about the orthodox view of fasting, right? Um, and pretty much why we do it, how we do it. Actually, that's what we're going to talk about today, how we do it and what exactly is the orthodox phrenema, right? Um, we talked about how or when the fast started, who instituted it and, you know, who instituted the fast? Three, God, right? And when did it start? Adam and Eve, right? So that's a concept that's lost a lot uh, to us. And it's just something like of a reminder, you know, when our kids ask, oh, where, where, who, who created this fast? Well, it's God. God created this fast uh, through Adam and Eve, right? So through part two, we're going to be talking about the Orthodox. And I'm going to kind of phonetically say it, fro nima, fro nima, okay? which is the orthodox way of thinking, all right? So again, I'm just recommending uh, a lot of my, I'm just a messenger, right? So I'm messing uh, uh, these two, two major books, right? Sanctify a Fast and Thinking Orthodox. Sanctify a Fast is by His Holiness Pope Shenouda III, and the um, Thinking Orthodox is by Dr. Eugenia Constantino, all right? Beautiful book. I really, really highly recommend it. She also wrote another one for the Holy Week. Um, can find on Amazon, can talk about it later. So what is phronema, right? Phronema links our thoughts, right? The way we think with action, okay? So it's very different than when we say wisdom or Sophia, right? Those are two different words in the Greek language, all right? So Sophia, again, differs from phronema. In the Old Testament Septuagint translation, all right, phronesis is considered a characteristic of God, and it's often translated in English, when we translate this word, we translate it as understanding. It's very difficult to translate specific Greek words to English because the Greek language is so much more rich, right? And we know this through the different words of, for love, right? We know love itself has how many words? Four words, right, in Greek? Right? We know this, I hope. So, um, and I'm not going to get into that, but the translating it is very, um, we do the best we can with the English language. All right? So it means understanding. It's all over Proverbs. Phronema, the word is all over uh, Proverbs. Therefore, we as Orthodox Christians are commanded to acquire the mind of Christ or AKA the understanding, the understanding of God. St. Paul says in Romans chapter 15, verses 5, he emphasizes proper attitude, which then leads to correct behavior. And I hinted this also in 1 Corinthians. We said 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. The, the Christians during the Corinthians time, they felt that they didn't need, they, they already achieved Christianity and that's it. We, what, whatever we do with our bodies doesn't matter. But Paul comes and says, no, what we do with our bodies actually matters right? In this life and the next. Because our physical bodies is how we manifest our understanding, right, of God. And also, it's how we manifest in our behavior, in our behavior, right? So, phronema involves the mind, but it's not formed by rationalism, but linked to behavior. It's linked to how we act, all right? Again, you're going to tell that it's actually difficult to define this, right? It's difficult to actually have a complete and concise definition because frenema is not just a mental attitude, but what we hinted at last it's week, it's our entire way of life. That's what it should be, right? So orthodoxy is a way of life, right? Paul emphasizes this need for correct frenema in Romans chapter 14, verses 6. He says frenema and he uses that word to explain attitude, right? To 
explain attitude towards abstaining from food or eating. So we see this in this verse. The one who regards the day regards it for the Lord. He also who eats, eats for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And the one who does not eat, does not eat for the Lord and give thanks to God. See the balance? Whether we're eating or not eating, whether we're fasting or not fasting. Okay? The early Christian church had this specific frenema, this specific frame of mind, and that is what's preserved today in the Orthodox Church. We inherited that thought, the way of thinking, from the Apostolic Fathers. All right? Orthodox frenema rests on a fundamental belief shared by Orthodox Christians that the Church has preserved apostolic tradition and will continually faithfully preserve it or will continue to faithfully preserve it. Because we are confident in the church, we do not replace its teachings and guidance with our own, in, with our individual opinions, right? I, I'm quoting a lot this time because it's very, um, you know, I can't say it better than, <laughs> than, um, than what I've read. So this is from uh, the book, Dr. Eugenia Constantino, Thinking Orthodox, all right? Everyone with me so far? It's a little heavy, okay? <laughs> but we want to understand, again, what makes us orthodox, Right? What did we say last week? What makes us Orthodox isn't the, the specifics, right? The, uh, the crossing the T's, dotting the I's, you know, the traditions, the, all, all of uh, the, uh, forgive me for saying, the pharisaic way of looking at things, right? What makes us Orthodox is our thinking, the way we think, and that's what we inherited from the ancient church. So Orthodoxy today, and I want to stress this, it's not isolated from the world. All right. We tend to isolate, but we have to remember that our gospel, right, the teaching is that the church has to present itself and interact with the entire world as an authentic and living Christian church. And as an authentic and living Christian church, that represents the ancient church, all right, and a continuation of the ancient church. We differ because our thought process differs, right, not just our conclusions. So how we arrive to our conclusions in orthodoxy um, is how orthodoxy maintains that unity of faith. All right, so that is pretty much what orthodox frenema is. It's characterized by unity of faith and preserving it. And what, what do we say in church? We preserve it from as it was and it shall be from generation to generation, right? Our church is reminding us that we continue to preserve this thought process. Everyone with me so far? All right. So it's interconnected. You notice in our Orthodox Church, it's very interconnected. Everything is connected to each other. Everything is synergistic to each other. Synergistic, do you guys know the definition of synergy? Right? So when you put one plus one equals five, right? That's synergistic. Not one plus one equals two. It's not additive, right? When we add or when we become synergistic, we exponentially grow. Does that make sense? So scriptures, traditions, and traditions of the fathers, specifically theology, spirituality, and our lifestyle, all of that is synergistic, all right? We don't separately discuss these things or define anything really, because if we do, we distort orthodoxy, and then we misrepresent it, all right? So it's a focus uh, less on the mind. Orthodoxy is a focus less on the mind and more on the heart. And we, when we focus on our heart, that's, that's where we encounter God, right? Um, that's our foundation, pretty much, this mentality. All right, so now... This is a really like <laughs> this is a sp really small summary of, of the book, but applying this mentality now to fasting, how do we take that? How do we extract that? All right, learning how, when, and why to fast is much easier, and you'll see this a lot in converts. Right, it's much easier than learning the correct attitude and the understanding about fasting. Right, so we can see that we can learn the ins and outs. We can be very very vigilant you know, zealous, rigid. But 
you know, to the point I, 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 just, I have to use this example. I had a friend who's a convert, you know, in, in college, right? You know, met him in pharmacy school. And those of you who don't know, I went to pharmacy school, then went to medical school. It's really a really crazy ride. But um, he he he's now a monk, by the way, this convert. All right. Long story short, you know, he's like, oh, what is this fast? I remember it vividly. He's like, oh, it's fasting. <laughs> he would come to church in the morning eating his egg, you know, eggs and egg sandwich and chicken sandwich, whatever he's eating on the way to church. As I was driving him to church, I was like, his name was Matt at the time. I was like, Matt, come on, man. Like, this is, this is it's a little pushing. He's like, yeah, no, fasting's not for me. Eventually, you know, he became so, like, enamored with orthodoxy that he started teaching me <laughs> how to fast on Friday, Wednesdays and Fridays. That was something that kind of, you know, you lost, you lose in college. You're, oh, Wednesday and Fridays, what is, that's fine. And I'm sitting there eating a TGI Fridays with him, and then he's, like, ordering fries. <laughs> and I'm like, at the time, they didn't have, like, the, you know, the Boca burgers. And big, yeah, like that. They just have fries or, like, s- sides, right? I'm like, Matt, what are you doing? Like, you're, you're always hungry. He's uh, vigilant and working out, too, and everything. He's like, oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. He didn't want to say anything. I was like, come on, bro. What's going on? And finally, he's like, oh, I'm fasting. I was like, dang it. And I had just ordered my Jack, Di- Jack Daniels burger. I was like, ah. I was like, I cancel my order. I need, I need some fries and honey mustard on the side, whatever. You know, so anyways, the, the idea is he, he, you know, at the beginning, he really – didn't really feel the fast, but once he started to understand why we fast and what we do it, and why we do it and how to do it, he was so to the point where he just exceeded anyone born in orthodoxy, aka me. And his name is now Abuna Daniel. He's in um, the monastery in St. Uh, Moses the Black and uh, Corpus Christi, right? And I just remember he called me. He's like, hey, you want to go to the monastery with me? I was like, no, I'm of the world. You, <laughs> you can go ahead and uh, sacrifice that, but I'm, I'm staying here. You know, <laughs> like, it's, I, I know my limitations, which is something else that we'll discuss about orthodoxy, right? We insist and lean heavily into the correct formula for salvation and what we must do. This is, we're still talking about fasting. But equally important, though, and that's what I'm emphasizing, is the mental attitude towards fasting. All right, and towards why we do things the way we do. So an orthodox frenema or fasting frenema is much harder to grasp, right, than simply learning the rules of the fast. All right, um, that's why it's difficult sometimes to explain this concept of orthodox frenema. It's not a light switch, right? We're not going to be oh, I acquired the uh, orthodox frenema. I'm, I'm, that's it. I'm good. Kind of not how it works, right? It's a process. It develops over time. It develops, uh, you know, it it kind of becomes us, right? And the result of that is peace, right? And a peace that we don't find anywhere else, right? So you'll see a lot, and I, I, you know, I challenge you. You'll see a lot of Orthodox Christians who have this Orthodox frenema uh, not feeling obligated to cross T's, dot I's, right? They, they, you know, they, they, they just seem at peace with everything in their lives, right? Um, orthodoxy allows us, now this is important, it allows us, I told you last week, right, that orthodoxy is actually flexibility, not rigidity. So it even allows these limitations within our lives, right? And to accept our limitations and to depend on the unlimitless, which is God, right? Um, And in order to depend on that, this is why orthodoxy doesn't teach just intellectualism, right? Because we can't just be intellectual, right? And resolving something unresolvable like God, like you, I challenge, right? When we describe God, how are we describing him, right? It was, it's always in negations, right? To our limited understanding. We say he's power, all powerful. What's all powerful? We know what powerful is, right? We don't know what's all powerful. He's unlimited, you know, invisible, right? Uncontainable right? You hear all of that. It's all negations based on our limited understanding. So we take the church, our spiritual lives, and our doctrine extremely seriously, and yet the orthodox frenema is essentially relaxed. It is not rigid, not demanding, not stressed, but calm. Anxiety and obsessiveness are qualities of the world, but our relationship with Christ results in freedom and inner peace. This is reflected in our frenema. Again, from thinking orthodox. All right. 
Our friend Emma is the reason our Orthodox Church still remains stable to this day. The church today is the same as a thousand years ago, which will be the same as a thousand years in the future because of this friend Emma. All right. So fasting and friend Emma has al- fasting has always been part, we said, of the Christian life. Anyone who practices it knows its usefulness and knows it's not as an exercise, but as a part of something, another Greek word, ascesis, all right, which is where we derive asceticism from, right? So what does it mean to be ascetic? Does anyone know? Ascesis equals struggle, to struggle, all right? The ascetic exercises are actions of self-control, designed to master our bodies and bring it under the control of the soul. So this then helps illuminate our minds. All right. So we distort orthodoxy when we separate our ascetic actions, right, which is actions that heal our soul. If we separate from the ascetic actions that heal our souls. All right. So everything in our church, like I said, including icons, we just in liturgies, hymns, sacraments, theology, fasting, all has a purpose. And what's that purpose? Upward ascent, right? Towards purification and illumination. I was just uh, actually real quick. I was taking notes on, uh, you know, fast, the fasting Madiha today, the, the thing at the end of the communion that we were singing. Fasting is a constant shining light. Right. That, that's the first word that <laughs> the first words right after the Psalm 150. That's what the church just said. Fasting is a constant shining light. All right. Our goal is illumination without recognizing that our goal in everything here is spiritual healing. Then we gain no profit of this. Right. If we think about fasting just as this exercise. Right. Orthodox life without ascesis, a.k.a. Orthodox life without struggle is secular, meaning of the world, because it's divorced from that spiritual struggle, right, and improvement. All right, so you guys hinted, I'm kind of rushing through because I know we're a little bit uh, behind schedule, but the type of food, this is a big thing, right, the type of food. All right, fine, fasting, great. Okay, so why? Why are we fasting the way we fast, right? Why? Daniel states, I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. All right. We should refrain. We should stop what we desire. And we kind of hinted at that last time. Okay. So why vegan? (laughs) Right. Anyone knows? It links right to last week. Where did the fast start? Adam and Eve. I mean, what was the divine arrangement in the garden? And we're, we all agree, right? We all agree on the creation. We all agree in Adam and Eve, correct? Right? So what was that divine arrangement? Every, everything but the tree, right? Adam and Eve were vegan <laughs> until Noah's time. Now, we're not going to like say specifically, right? That this is what the church is trying to remind us, Right? the extent the creation of humanity from its purest form was that right when we look god created man vegan i'm not saying everyone has to be vegan by the way but do you understand the concept of why now we fast because our goal is purification our goal is reinstatement of what we are from what we lost you get what i mean right so See, I have given you every herb that yields, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every, this is what's really interesting. I'm not going to go into this in depth. To every beast of the earth, animals, right? To every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. All right. That was the divine arrangement. That was the purification. That's that's before our fall. Okay, so now vegan. Okay, fine. Yikes. All right, that's... All right, even when man was evicted from the Garden of Eden, right, he continued to be vegan, but was allowed to grow and eat vegetables, right? So uh, we see in Genesis 3, uh, 18, but both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. 
No one died from dehydration, malnutrition, right? Actually, it's quite the opposite, right? How long did these guys live for? It's kind of crazy, crazy, right? 800 years, like that's not, it's really like fantastical, right? Right? So, um, so after the flood, this is, and what, what happened with the flood? What do we, I mean, humanity reached its like peak of, uh, you know, uh, we'll say like, you, you know, humanity wasn't really great. Right. So uh, God allowed the flood to happen and man then was permitted to eat meat after. So you see in Genesis chapter nine, verse three through four, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is its blood, obviously. Right. So you see another example of what purified food is. Right. We have to use physical examples in our minds because to understand God gave what did God provide the children of Israel after Egypt to feed them. He didn't provide meat. He provided manna. Right. And this manna was like a bread like substance. Right. Um, And uh, even when you saw when God allowed them to eat meat after you read the rest of this uh, um, story from Exodus to Numbers, it was actually out of wrath. Right due to their cravings and complaint against men. So they were subjected again to the flesh. You see the, the common thread, right? They just could, you know, uh, couldn't have their spirit overpower the, the body, right? So vegan is light. It's a light substance, right? It's not heavy, right? You guys notice when you eat an hour later, you're like, man, did I eat? Like, I don't remember if I ate or I'm super hungry. I'm always like, like, I just don't, everything's going in and out. Right. <laughs> so it's actually on purpose. Right. When you see like carnivores, carnivores, excuse me, they're aggressive, aggressive, you know, uh, animals. Right. And herbivores usually are docile. Right. Um, it's ironic that most of our meats, what do we eat most of the time? Like cows, chicken, you know, th- these guys are like usually, you know, cows. I'll just say cows. Like uh, I love burgers, right? I love steak. What do they eat? Do they eat meat? Just ironic. Just something to think about, right? Is that they're usually vegetarians, right? The lifespan of vegans are much longer and healthier. And we saw this in, even in the Bible. When our bodies are light, this is the point. They are more active and not lazy, right? When I'm eating... It's just, I, you know, I get groggy, I get kind of like blah, right? But this allows the spirit to be free, all right? So Pope Shenouda says, when, what tires the body is not fasting, but eating. Too much eating, overstuffing of the stomach, loss of control, and eating between meals causes the body to suffer. So then how do we fast? And this is the last few slides, right? What is fasting, first thing? It's two things. All right, and this is something very important for all of us to know. It's one, abstaining from food. And then the second part is eating food free from animals. Usually we just focus on that second part. But I think we hinted at it last time, right? That to practice fasting, it's both abstaining and not gorging, right? He clarified, Pope Shunua clarifies that this period of abstinence differs. And this is where we have our orthodox flexibility, right? It's not necessarily, it's per person. Each spiritual level differs, right? Each person's age differs. You think I'm going to tell my two-year-old girls to fast for 10 hours? Or do you think I'm going to, like, you know, they they want, like, chicken nuggets. I'm going to feed them, you know, plants? (laughs) No, right? Like, honestly, it's it's different, right? So it's not so rigid, right? And this this is the beauty of our church, right? Um, even the type of work we do. Again, this is where I kind of stress and I really, really encourage everyone to have their father of confession, right? That, that link, that spiritual link, see where you're at, right? See what our fathers are, you know, uh, uh, are leading us to, right? And where we're at in our, in our spirituality, right? So what matters to us is the spiritual condition of the period of abstention. We do not want to enter into formalities or special rules about the period of abstention, but we want to speak about the way in which a person can benefit spiritually during this period, as it is possible for a person 
to abstain from food till three o'clock or till the evening or later, yet not benefit spiritually due to not fasting in a spiritual way. So we can do the fast correctly, yet not benefit. Okay. So spiritual way. What is that? Pope Shuna gives us four clear cut things, right? One, practice to not give in to the demands of the body. Practice, number two, to not eat with appetite, right? That's what Daniel does, right? This is not something that we're making up. This is something that we, again, reference back to the Bible, right? We said it, Daniel, earlier, right? I do not eat what I desire. Number three, practice not to look forward to gorging ourselves when we abstain, right? Be led by your spiritualities and not by the clock, is what Pope Shunuda says, right? So fasting becomes more beneficial the more we reach that sensation of hunger and then holding on to that sensation of hunger. All right. We don't go to the hunger and then a minute later, you know, fall in. We gain spiritual benefits from the sensation. When we experience hunger, we then become conscious of our weakness in our bodies. That strengthens our spirits and we know our limitations and we rely more on God through our prayers. It humbles us realizing we can't do anything without God. But we practice fasting and hunger within our, again, I'm stressing, within our physical limitations. All right? I'm not saying everyone has to be the exact same. And that's, what not, that's the church. The church is not saying that. Right? Fasting, then, that's why is always linked with prayer. We, prayers, when we're hungry, are much more intense. We're much more focused. Right? When we pray with a full stomach, we become distracted. We're lazy. We're tired. When we're full in body, we're not full in spirit, right? And that's why the church always links the fasting and prayer. I'll Pope Shunuda again. I can't, you can't, you can't beat this. Two minutes that you pray when hungry are better than two hours when full, right? Again, we all pray before we eat. How many of us pray after we eat? Something to think about, right? So... We end it here. If we limit our interpretation of fasting to being, to being the humbling of the body through hunger and abstaining from what it desires, we would be taking the negative of fasting and leaving its positive spiritual work. Fasting is not hungering the body, but it's nourishing the spirit. We transcend the body to reach cooperation with the spirit. Right? We're not torturing our bodies, but we do not walk according to the flesh. Right? Um, and, and this is the final verse. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. St. Paul says this. For those, and you guys know this. You guys know this, but now the application of it is so much more, hopefully, right? For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For, the, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, right? Mind, frenema, thinking, actions, behavior, all linked together, okay? And that's it. Yeah. Any, any questions, any concerns, and hopefully a uh, little, little past time. These are the references, but if you guys want to talk after or anything like that, we can, but... Go ahead and pray if you want.